to the Unseen Podcast, a podcast dedicated to missing people, unresolved cases and UK true crime. Today we are going to look at the murders of two women in 1975 that caused a large-scale police investigation. Eve Stratford was just 22 years old when she was killed, and Lynn Whedon was only 16 years old. Unfortunately, despite the vicious nature of both crimes and key information coming out about them, they are still unsolved in the present day. This episode contains descriptions that some listeners may find distressing, so listener discretion is advised. The year 1975 saw a number of changes to society and lifestyle in London. Londoners were embracing punk music and enjoying new music from the likes of Queen with Bohemian Rhapsody and Bruce Springsteen's famous album Born to Run. The UK was facing an EU referendum about remaining or leaving Europe and London was rocked by a number of attacks by the IRA, including bomb attacks on pubs and hotels. It was a year of uncertainty, but also a time for many to foster creativity and expression. Eve Stratford was just 19 when she moved to Leighton, East London, close to the areas of Walthamstow and Leightonstone, and around six miles from central London. She moved in with her boyfriend and had spent a number of years in her childhood moving around the world due to her father's job. Eve's mother was German and her father worked as a medic in the Royal Army Medical Corps. She was used to moving around and her family eventually relocated to Aldershot in Hampshire, around 42 miles from London. Eve was a motivated and attractive young woman who enjoyed being sociable and liked the London social scene that was afforded to her in the 1970s. In 1973, a friend recommended a club that she might want to work at. The club was a playboy club in Park Lane, Mayfair. The Playboy Club at 45 Park Lane opened in 1966 and its opening night was a huge affair, attracting celebrities from all around the world. The building contained 10 storeys and was built to house a casino, bars, restaurants and had serviced apartments on the top to house performers who visited or celebrities that wanted to stay there. The club was extremely successful and they even hosted Roman Polanski and Sharon Tate's wedding reception in 1968. By the 70s, the club was doing so well that it was thought to be keeping the whole playboy business worldwide afloat. Many women worked as bunnies at the club and its popularity soared, particularly in 1975 when it became the largest casino in Europe. In 1980, the club was forced to shut down when its casino licence wasn't renewed. It is thought that Playboy Enterprises as a whole was majorly affected by this, going from $31 million profit the year previous to losing $51 million the year after. Eve began working at the club in 1973 when it was at the peak of its popularity, and by all accounts it was a job that she enjoyed. In early 1975, Eve got the chance to be photographed for a centrefold in the magazine Mayfair, which was an adult magazine. On the 18th of March 1975, Eve had been out for the day and arrived back by tube at around 3.45 that afternoon. She was seen walking towards her home at Lyndhurst Drive in Leighton at around 3.58pm and it was noticed that she was walking alone in the snow to get back to her home. Her boyfriend returned to the home that they shared with other members of his band at around 5.25pm. He entered the home and went to the couple's bedroom, where he discovered a horrific scene. He had found Eve with her hands tied together and deep wounds to her neck. She had tragically died. Police were immediately called and quickly cordoned off the scene. It was clear that Eve had been brutally attacked and the police were aware that they needed to collect as much evidence from the scene as they could. Upon entering the house it was obvious that there had been no forced entry and nobody seemed to have broken in through other areas of the home such as windows. Eve had her hands tied behind her back using a scarf and she had one stocking hanging off one ankle. She was partially clothed when she was found. Reports stated that she was only wearing a dressing gown. 
It was clear that Eve had been attacked with a knife or a sharp object that had caused the wounds to her neck. After investigation of the scene, Eve's body was sent for a post-mortem at Walthamstow Mortuary. While this was taking place, police canvassed the area and tried to establish what Eve's movements had been that day and if anyone heard or saw anything suspicious. The police were able to figure out from witnesses in the area that Eve had been spotted travelling back from her home at close to four o'clock. She had also been seen getting off the tube at Leighton Stone Tube Station at around 3.45pm. The walk from her home was around 17 minutes, therefore when she was spotted at 4pm she would have been close. This narrowed down the time frame for Eve's attack, as this gave police around an hour and 25 minutes to investigate before she was discovered by her boyfriend. During the canvas of the area, Detective spoke to neighbours of Eve's that lived below her. The neighbours explained that around half four that afternoon, they had heard a man and a woman talking upstairs, and then they had heard a loud bump after that. Police took this tip seriously, and they used this information to narrow down the timeline of when the attack might have happened. The police were also very interested in tracing Eve's movements that day and where she had travelled to before she got back home. The investigators were able to track that she had been to Camden and Bayswater that day, and they could say with some certainty that she had not been followed on her way back. However, this could not be established with 100% certainty, as CCTV was not a widely used resource as it is today. The post-mortem was carried out, and the result was that Eve had died from the knife wounds to her throat. She had reportedly been stabbed 12 times. The police did have insight to take samples from Eve's body in case they were able to match this to anything that was found in the future. They were able to gain a full male DNA sample from semen that was on the card of the dressing gown that Eve was wearing. There was nothing else found in the flat itself aside from a diary containing some contact details for some people that Eve knew. The police were unable to find a murder weapon. As a number of the newspapers that reported on this at the time were tabloids, there are some conflicting reports about a bouquet of flowers that was found close to Eve's body. Some reports explain that Eve had bought the flowers and brought them into the flat. However, most reports appear to suggest that Eve, nor her other flatmates, had bought the flowers. If this was indeed the case, then it has been speculated that these had been left there by the killer as some sort of symbol. It was also reported that police used a police officer dressed in similar clothes to Eve's to retrace her steps from the tube station to her home in an effort to jog people's memories. Other young women in the area were worried about what had happened to Eve, and many were concerned that the killer might strike again in the area. Police were able to gain some more vague descriptions of men who had been seen in the area and showed these efforts to Eve's neighbours, however no concrete suspects emerged. Police had, however, compiled a list of some possible suspects. The investigation into Eve's murder continued into 1975, but later that year another murder would also take place and would shock everyone. Six months later, on the 3rd of September 1975, 16-year-old Lynn Whedon was walking home after spending time with some friends. Lynn lived in Hounslow, West London. She was travelling along Great West Road in Hounslow at around 11.20pm that night. Lynn decided to take a shortcut home and travelled down an alleyway called the Short Hedges. Lynn, however, did not make it home that night. The next morning she was found in the grounds of an electricity substation by the caretaker. She had horrific injuries but she was still alive. The caretaker rang for an ambulance and they took her to West Middlesex Hospital. It was discovered that Lynn had been hit over the head with a heavy and blunt object and there was evidence that she had been sexually assaulted. After being rushed to hospital, Lynn spent a week there before she tragically died from her injuries. The police were now looking for a murderer. It was clear that Lynn had not been with anyone during her walk home that day, 
and that someone had possibly seen her on her walk and decided to attack her. The police were sure that they were looking for someone dangerous, considering that a sexual assault also took place. The fact that the perpetrator had lifted Lynn over a fence to put her in the grounds of the electricity substation also means that they were dealing with someone strong enough to do that. As Lynn had simply been going home, the police began investigating whether she could have been stalked by the killer to that location. It was clear that Lynn did not have any enemies that anyone knew of, and she had certainly not had any problems with anyone to warrant such an attack. Detective Chief Superintendent Davis Frew at the time stated that the perpetrator must have got blood on his clothes after the attack and he appealed for anyone who had a friend or relative who returned home in an odd state or looking dishevelled. The police also searched the area to look for the possible murder weapon, and they appealed to anyone who was in the Hounslow area and might have seen Lynn walking home. They asked for anyone who saw her walking wearing blue jeans, a blue and white jumper, a long blue and white cardigan and platform sandals. They also warned that the killer could strike again and that the public needed to be aware and take care when walking alone. The investigation was unfortunately not able to find any possible suspects in the murder of Lynn Whedon. But around three years later in 1977, the murder of another young girl brought Lynn's case back into the headlines. On the 14th of April 1977, Coral Vidler, who was also 16, was attacked ferociously and hit on the head and in the face several times with an object. Coral had been at a church hall disco with her friend and her boyfriend. When it had finished, they left and her boyfriend left them to wait at the bus stop. Coral decided to cut through the alleyway and this is where she was attacked and killed. The murder happened in Hornchurch, Essex, around 30 miles away from Hounslow, where Lynn Whedon's murder had occurred. However, the similarities stood out to police. They publicly stated in the newspapers that they were not ruling out the possibility that they were committed by the same person. In Coral's case, they stated that it was such a brutal attack that the killer would certainly have been covered in blood, and that he most definitely was disturbed. Five months later, another horrific crime happened. This time, it occurred close to the area in which Lynn Whedon had been murdered. 27-year-old Elizabeth Paravincina had travelled back to the UK from Rome, where she lived with her husband, to visit her parents close to the Hounslow area in September 1977. She was a keen amateur actress, and she went to watch a film at the cinema one evening. On her way home at around midnight, she travelled back to Osterley Park tube station. She did not return to her parents' home that night, and her father went out to look for her just after dawn. It was he who made the awful discovery of Elizabeth's body in some bushes on the way from his home. Elizabeth had been beaten to death. The police put out an appeal for anyone that might have seen Elizabeth that night at the tube station or on her way home. They also stated that they were not ruling out the fact that her death may also be linked to Lynn Whedon's. This time due to the proximity of the attacks and the timing both being close to midnight when they happened. There was also the fact that they were both so brutal and violent and seemingly committed by strangers. It is notable that Elizabeth did not even live in the country, so the likelihood of it being committed by someone she knew was much smaller. Both of these murders in 1977 were shocking, and the fact that again no suspects could be found also made many people worried about whether the same thing could happen to them. The years went by in the investigations of the murders of these women, and unfortunately nothing of note was found to aid the police. In 2004, Lynn's case was reopened as part of the Metropolitan Police's murder review group in a bid to discover any more information about what could have happened to her. The investigators combed back over anything that was seen as relevant at the time and looked at all the evidence that had been collected, including some DNA that had been recovered from Lynn's body. 
This DNA was analysed using new forensic techniques that had not been available in the 70s. A profile was obtained and compared to other crimes and perpetrators in the DNA database. The profile was not a match to any known criminals, therefore it was deducted that it was not someone who had been arrested after Lynn's murder. However, it did match a profile that police had on file. The DNA from Lynn's murder matched the profile that had been obtained from the dressing gown of Eve Stratford. The same person had killed both Lynn and Eve. This changed the dynamic of the investigation, as they were now looking for someone who had killed at least two people. There were lots of things that were in some way dissimilar in the crimes. They were committed in different parts of London. The women had been killed in different ways, and Eve had been killed in the early evening, while Lynn had been killed at midnight. Their ages were also different. Therefore, it is possible that their connection would not have been made without the DNA match. One thing that was similar about both crimes was that they were both sexually motivated. This was stated unequivocally on an appeal on Crime Watch in 2007, in which they asked for anyone who knows anything about the crimes to come forward. Detective Chief Inspector Andy Mortimer explained that new advances in DNA technology had allowed them to investigate cold cases much more thoroughly than before. He also stated that he believed someone had been keeping a dark secret for more than 30 years and that he did not think they had kept it to themselves. Detective Inspector Mortimer stated that he believed that they would have confided in someone. After the information was discovered that the two crimes were connected, investigators began to question if other crimes were also connected to the same perpetrator. They began to focus on the murder of another woman, Linda Farrow. Linda Farrow worked as a croupier at the International Sporting Club in 1979. The club was described in a New York Times article in 1978 as one of the casinos for the mass market, and it did not attract customers that were as affluent as the top casinos, like the Claremonts and Crockfords. It was described more as being similar to Las Vegas casinos, very busy and noisy. Linda had recently left her husband and had moved out with her two children. She was also pregnant with her third child. On January the 19th, 1979, Linda was found dead in her home, having been stabbed. After searching the house, the murder weapon was reportedly found in the kitchen and it was a serrated carving knife with a forked end. It was covered in blood when it was found. The police, like in the other cases, searched the house and surrounding areas for evidence and discovered four palm prints on the door frame, and they had also discovered some footprints in the snow around Linda's car. These footprints were said to belong to someone wearing monkey boots. These were ankle boots that had laces up the front and a substantial grip on the bottom. It was clear at the time that they were looking for someone violent and while there was some evidence around the house, no evidence was found that could be tested in 2007 when other cold cases were being investigated. At the time of the investigation, links between Eve Stratford and Linda Farrow were being made. These links revolve around the fact that both women worked in the casino industry, and they only lived five miles apart from one another. They were also both brutally stabbed in their own homes, and reports state that both had no sign of forced entry into their houses. Now that the link between Eve Stratford and Lynn Whedon had been made, investigators also began to wonder if Linda Farrow could be linked as well. The lack of DNA evidence to test, however, meant that they could not officially link the cases together. Investigators remained confident that they were in some way linked. DCI Colin Sutton, who famously investigated the Levi Belfield serial killings, had launched a reinvestigation into Linda Farrow's death in 2004, but had to focus on the Levi Belfield case, so could not continue with it. After the Crime Watch appeal in 2008, the team which had discovered the DNA link were given funding to continue looking into cold cases until 2011. 
it is known that the police continued to look into forensic links between the cases in the years that followed. And in 2015, the cases of Eve Stratford and Lynn Whedon were again featured on Crime Watch. The detectives appealed for anyone that could help them in the identification, arrest and prosecution of the person or people responsible for the killings, and they offered a £40,000 reward to anyone that could do that. Scotland Yard later reported that they had had more than 50 calls after the segment aired. The investigating officer, DCI Noel McHugh, again stressed the importance of people coming forward with any information, saying about the perpetrator, it's inconceivable that the killer of Eve and Lynn has kept the perfect secret for 40 years. It's a heavy burden to carry and he must have let key details slip over the years. Maybe to a partner or a friend, even a cellmate, and I would appeal to anyone with information to contact us. Despite the immediate success of the appeal, the tips did not lead to anybody being apprehended or any suspects coming forward. Into 2019, the cases have still not been solved. Despite the DNA link, the cases have proved very difficult to solve as the DNA has not linked to a specific person. It did allow police to rule out the 16 suspects that they had reportedly compiled. The other issue in this case is that they did not appear to have many descriptions of anybody that had been in the area, or even any people connected to both women that they could investigate. After such a long time, the case has uncovered some important information in terms of DNA, but it also shows that the person who perpetrated the crimes has not been caught for any other crimes as he is not on the National DNA Database. This, of course, does not mean that he has not committed any other crimes, but that he may have just not been caught for it. This fact is another worrying part of these cases, as it means that whoever has perpetrated it could have gone on to commit other crimes. Investigations continue in the cases of the women, and the hope is that something will come forward to break the case and give much-needed closure to the victims' families. The police have stated if anyone has any information about any of the cases, they can contact Crime Stoppers anonymously on 0800 555 111. Thank you for listening to today's episode. If you want to support the show, you can leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram to see pictures and updates for past and future episodes. We now have a Facebook discussion group to talk about the podcast and other things true crime. You can find us at the Unseen Podcast discussion group. You can also email us any ideas for future episodes or thoughts you have had about the podcast to theunseenpod at gmail.com. I love reading ideas and thoughts from listeners and any suggestions are always welcome. Once again, thanks for listening and until next week, I'm Caprice and this has been Unseen. Thank you.